Preachers can be dismissed. I get to preach extra long today. I'm kidding. Thank you. That was beautiful. It really was. Jeff and Mary, that was, thank you. It was very good. Wow. Oh, you had another song to play? What song was it? What's Okay, all right. You can do two songs at the end. There's nothing in the Bible that says how you got to do the, have to do the order. Speaking of your Bibles, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Have you ever read somebody else's mail? You know, you get letters in the mail. Have you ever opened up somebody else's letter and read them? Have you ever found an old letter maybe your grandparent wrote back home, especially wartime? I know my grandmother, she had five, five sons in the military. She wrote them all letters, World War II, etc. I'd love to have some of those. And if we were to take some of those letters and read them, they have a purpose, and uh, I think I could read the letter and determine what, what was the motivation. It was to let, let them back home know maybe that everything is going to go well, but I'm not going to be home at Christmas, and by the way, uh, you can go ahead and sell my car. I'm going to buy a different one when I get back, and you know, you can read the letter, and it's generally about how Bob is doing overseas, Right? Well, that's what we're doing when we're reading 1 Corinthians. We're reading somebody else's mail that was Paul writing to a church that he started. He was there in Corinth for a year and a half at least. That's what the book of Acts says. The town size was about the size of Cedar Rapids, 100,000 in the first century. That's a lot. A wide variety of people are getting saved, people from all kinds of backgrounds. It's a, it's a real messy start of a church. And yet, even after Paul leaves, he wants that church to do well. He wants them to thrive. He wants them to live out the Christian life. And so some of the things, like we're going to be seeing in chapter 16, are particular to that congregation. Now, a lot of the doctrinal and ethical things that we read are directly applied to us. How many agree with that? And Paul says, you know, in chapter 5 and 6, they had some interesting questions. And uh, everything ethically that's said is for us today. So we're reading somebody else's letter, inspired by God. Paul penned it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. All scriptures inspired by God, profitable for teaching and training in righteousness, etc. Right? For correcting us. And even the principles that are laid down, like we're going to see today, where... Paul, how many of you, you've been coming to church here for a long time. How many sermons have you ever heard me deal with giving? I even heard somebody say, yeah, I used to hate to go to church because it seemed like all they talked about was giving. I guarantee you, you could have come here for 25 years and you probably can't even remember me dealing with giving. Even though giving is a part of our Christian uh, worship, as a matter of fact, in our bulletin, I mean, did you ever read what we say? I, I just post this pretty much in every bulletin. We worship the Lord today as a congregation through prayer, giving, singing, and being taught God's Word. And today we're going to, yeah, if you got the questions, email to you, or if you're looking at them this morning, uh, Linda, Linda Gate, she started giving answers already. She brought me her answers to question one and two already. And I wish she could do that ahead of time. Maybe I'll send it out like on Monday morning, and you guys send me all your notes, all right? I'm glad you're studying it, and even if you don't do it like Linda did, hopefully you meditate on it during the week. So we are talking about that dreaded topic. Believe me, I do not like talking about it, but it's in God's Word, and it's been a part of my Christian life. And Pam and I got married. We were on the same page, and because it is an act of worship. As we see in chapter 16, this issue, and once again, let's ask the Lord to bless His Word as we read it. Lord, thank you. Thank you for all that you do for us, for saving us, bringing us into your kingdom. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins, 
the million other gifts that you give us. And Lord, everything that we have is yours. This is your world. This is your earth and air and the energy that we have and these bodies that we have, the ability to work. It is all really a gift of yours. And we are to be good stewards of what you've given us. So help us today as we look at your word, just as you inspired Paul to write this 2,000 years ago, would you help us to understand it and apply it in our situation we find ourselves in today. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's read uh, God's word, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also, on the first day of the week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collection be made when I come. When I arrive, whomever you may approve, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me, also, for me to go also, they will go with me. Well, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we have to realize this is unique. It is, a, it is about finances. It is about giving. And so let's just work down through here. If you have your questions, a lot of times I'll just take this text and bombard it with questions that I have. One of the best ways to do a Bible study is to look at the context and start bombarding it with questions. Who, what, where, when, why, and how. Just good inductive Bible study. And work down through it and see if God's word answers those questions that you have. So question number one that I have, what in the world was the collection of the saints in Jerusalem about? Well, first question, if you're a new Christian, maybe you've been a Christian for a while and you're like, yeah, this word saint, what in the world, why would you take a collection of saints? I've never met a saint. Have you ever met a saint? Well, if you're a Christian, you're a saint. And maybe you're a new Christian, maybe you haven't been a Christian that long, and you're like, I didn't know that I was a saint. It's the most common word for a believer. So we're called believers. We're called disciples. We're only called, the word Christian comes up three times in the New Testament. We're called saints. It's simply, the hagios is the Greek word. It means to be set apart for a particular purpose. So when we become Christians, God now sets us apart. Before we were doing life our way, right? God was not Lord of our life. We did life our way. Now that we're a Christian, we've been set apart. Now, in the Old Testament, in the temple, they had shovels that were set apart for the ashes of the altar sacrifice. So they were actually called holy shovels, right? My wife has a gravy bowl that was gifted from her great-grandmother, and it sits in a... In a china cabinet and when she's gone i change the oil in my lawnmower with that gravy bowl because it slides right underneath the mower perfectly i'm glad she's not sitting in here today no i would never use that gravy oh she isn't i would never use that gravy bowl why because it's not to catch the oil in the lawnmower it's set apart for a particular purpose that's, word, that's what the word hagios means. It's, it means to be set apart. You're set apart if you're a Christian. And so this idea of saints, as you look at question number two, I'll give you a little homework to do if you've never done a study on this. A, the word saint, it doesn't mean, oh, they're a, we're going to have a special row up here, and only the saints get to sit in that row. They're the really special people, right? They're saints. They've really proved themselves and how they live. And we all, we're not saints, but we're going to call them saints. That's not in the New Testament. So, so if you got your homework for this week, it's to look up every, that's what Linda did for me, and I'm not going to give you the cheat sheet. She went through and evidently looked up all these verses and told you uh, what the saints did. They uh, practiced hospitality. They contributed uh, to the poor. They recognized God's, uh, I can't read all your handwriting. 
they're sanctified, they're called, uh, etc. And by the way, and I just gave you a few of these. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians, the one that I have there for you. Let's just, we're in 1 Corinthians. Let's take a look at chapter 1. Chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter one, verse two, to the assembly of God, to the church, Greek assembly, ecclesia. This is God's assembly in Corinth. To those who have been sanctified, comes from the same root word as hagias, sanctified, set apart. Those who have been set apart in Christ, saints by calling. With all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord's and ours. I'll save you time, okay? I'm not going to look up all these references, because I already have. Every single Christian is called a saint. It's just the most common word in the New Testament. So wives, look at your husband and say, you are a saint, all right? Kids, look at your parents, mom and dad, tell mom and dad, mom and dad, you're you guys are saints. Come on, I, I need to hear it. Because I wonder if we, if we thought of ourselves that way, does it start to transform how we look at our life? I've been saved by Jesus Christ. I am now set apart for him. That's why throughout this book, this isn't proper for the saints. That's how the world acts. And so as you read through Corinthians, Paul is straightening them out that, look, Christians are not to live this way. By the way, chapter 6. Did you know the saints are going to judge the world? That's what he says in chapter 6. He doesn't elaborate on it. In chapter 14, verse 33, he talks about the saints. For God is in, not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Now, let's go back to this. What is the collection for the saints? Now, according, you know, I'm writing this to take up a collection for the saints. Where? In Jerusalem. All right, question. Why would they have a collection for the saints in Jerusalem? Well, Paul mentions this at, in the book of Romans at the end of chapter 15. So there's another reference. So there's more than just this one reference. Evidently, there's something going on in Jerusalem. Corinth is not too far from Athens, by the way, right? It's a Greek city, but under Roman occupation, so really it's a Roman city. And all the way back in Jerusalem, Paul's saying, Corinth, I want you guys to take up a collection, each one of you. Each one of you set aside money, and so on the first day, that's Sunday, okay, you set, up, set that apart. So when I come, there's no need for a collection. Why? It's already collected. And then I want you to, to pick out some people, and I want them to take the gift to the saints in Jerusalem. What do we know about them? There have been, how many of you have read about famines around the world? I read about some famines, like I, I typed in famines. You know, in India, I think it was the 1700s, 10 million people died from a famine. And you can just go through, and read about all of these famines, and how many nations experienced famines. Josephus, the Jewish historian, said that there was a famine that happened that killed over 20,000 people in Israel. 20,000. In 1235 A.D., in England, 20,000 in London. The Great Famine in Europe, 1315. I wrote some of these down in case you're interested. In two years, 7 million people died because of a famine. Something's going on in Jerusalem, and in Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 11, there is a talk about a famine that happened during the reign of Claudius. Claudius, the emperor, reigned from 41 to 54. So picture this. You guys are Jewish, and now that you're Christians, you're kicked out of synagogues, you're having a hard time finding employment, and there's been a famine, you guys need help. Do you know in Pakistan, if, you, if, if they know you're a Christian, 
uh, you can't get your license, you can't work, you're, you're an outcast in our little community, you're going to have a hard time making it. All you people who claim to be Christians, you're going to have a hard time making it. Imagine if that were to ever happen in our nation. Oh, you're a Christian? Uh, you're fired. Oh, that would never happen. Oh, really? Could a famine happen to where people are destitute? So what happened in Jerusalem, we don't know all the details. Paul mentions it in 1 Corinthians chapter 25, 26, chapter 15, verse 25, 26, and 27. Let me just read it. It's just one book over to the left, by the way. If you're in 1 Corinthians, turn over to the right a few pages, and you can read about what Paul writes to the believers at Rome, the center of the Roman Empire, <laughs> right? This is what he, he wrote them. Are you there? Chapter 15, verse 25. But now I'm going to Jerusalem serving the saints, so serving believers who are in Jerusalem, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do so, and they are indebted to them, for the Gentiles, those of the nations, have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. Don't you know that there was a tension in the first century between the Jewish believers and the non-Jewish believers? There's a tension. The whole book of Romans is written to fix this tension. All of you are sinners and under the wrath of God. How are you saved, you Jews? By faith in Jesus. How are you guys saved? By faith in Jesus. How come you guys can't get along? How come you're arrogant towards one another? We all share the same humanity. We're sinners in need of saving. And if there's only one way to be saved, and it's through Jesus, how in the world can any of you guys be arrogant towards one another based on your ethnic background or whatever background you have? The cross levels all of us, and so I think what Paul's doing is beautiful. Let's help out, let's help out the saints in Jerusalem. To show that we love them and we care about them. What would they need? If famine hits, what do you need? Food and maybe clothing. Basic needs. So Paul takes this gift, and so he's mentioning it to the church at Rome. I'm going to Rome to serve. And so he says, he even mentions the churches in Macedonia and Achaia. That's back in the first century. That would include the Corinthians. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians 16, and let's walk our through this and understand first of all the context of what Paul's talking about first of all he says the collection for the saints in, as we know in context in Jerusalem we know by other contexts poor probably based on the famine probably based on their faith in Christ it's causing a condition that they are poor and destitute let's send them a gift to help them out and Paul says as I directed the churches of Galatia, where's that at? You ever, anybody here been to modern Turkey? I just had dinner with somebody, lunch yesterday with a lady. I ate lunch with a lady and her husband. And I won't say who it is in case she doesn't want everybody to know. And uh, she's been there. And so the Galatian churches are in what we would call modern day Turkey. What's Paul say? I already directed that chur those churches to what? To be a part of this. Church at Rome's a part of it. The church at Corinth, close to Athens. Let's keep war working our way down through here. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he or she may prosper so that no collection be made when I come. What's the first, first of all, what's the first day of the week? It's Sunday. When, what day did the Jews meet throughout the whole Old Testament? They, they, they rested on the Sabbath day. When do Jews today go to synagogue on the Saturday? When, when have Christians started meeting on the first day of the week? Because that the gospel accounts all make it clear that Jesus rose, and it says on the first day of the week. The women go to the tomb early. This is Matthew chapter 28, Right? And they fall down and worship Jesus. And, and you read other accounts of Jewish Christians in the first century. They say this, we meet on the first day of the week because it's the day when our Lord Jesus Christ conquered death. 
So, first day of the week, the church is assembled together. Now, you might say, I'm kind of interested in, in that. You might want to write down these verses. Matthew 28, 1 through 10. They took hold of Jesus and they worshiped. First day of the week. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Luke chapter 23, verses 55 through 24, 2. And then Acts 20, verse 7. Acts 20, verse 7 has an interesting verse there. When Paul is, I believe it's at Ephesus. It says, we sailed from Philippi. Yeah, this is Acts chapter 20, verse 6. We sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, came to Troas within five days, and there we stayed seven days. Here's verse 7, listen to this. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day. He prolonged his message until midnight. They probably met in the evening. Let me read to you, if you want me to, or not, I will. The Didache, so we've been meeting as Christians now for 2,000 years on Sunday. The Didache, written around 80 to 90 AD, of course. And this is what it says. And on the day of our Lord's resurrection, which is the Lord's day, meet more diligently. The letter of Barnabas, AD 74. We keep the eighth day, which is Sunday, with joyfulness, the day on which Jesus rose again from the dead. The pastor Ignatius, we have his letters that he wrote. The bishop, a pastor in Antioch. He died around 108. This is what he wrote. Let every friend of Christ keep the Lord's Day as a festival, the resurrection day, the queen and chief of all days of the week. Justin Martyr lived around 8100 to 168. But Sunday is a day in which we all hold our common assembly because it is, it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world and Jesus Christ our Savior on the same day rose from the dead. Now, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 16. This is, this is what I think is happening here. You know, when you guys meet on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, you set aside and saved. So when I, the collection is a special collection. It's specifically for the saints in Jerusalem. So I ask a question, does our church ever have special collections? Well, we're doing one right now, right? We do one, can you name them? Lottie Moon Christmas offering, named after a missionary to China. So for over 125 plus years, we've been giving money in what month? December. You know what? It would be good to start saving up now because it's purposeful. And it says each one, each one is a set aside based on your own income and where you're at, because people are at different levels. But each one is contributing to the saints in Jerusalem. Each one, I would say, Jesus told us to send out missionaries. And if we're not going, shouldn't we be the ones to help send them on? So who supported the missionaries in the first century? Other Christians. Sometimes Paul would do some tent making, but if you read all of his letters... Listen to Philippians chapter 4, how Paul wrote to the church at Philippi about their giving to him to go be on the mission field. So, Lottie Moon Christmas offering, we set aside. Pam and I do this every Christmas. What were you thinking how much we ought to give? I was thinking this. That's exactly what I was thinking. We're setting aside money, and so we know when Lottie Moon starts, what's another one that we take up? Annie Armstrong, she's another missionary. And that goes to support missionaries. How many know we need missionaries? So new church starts on campuses, different towns, right? Different ethnic groups. So that's around Easter time. So we take up a special collection. That's what Paul's talking about here. Not only did they have the local support of that congregation, but at different times, like this one, let's say a tragedy, God forbid, a, a tragedy would happen, and we would know people in a specific area. Could you see our church? By the way, every collection that we take up every Sunday goes to what's called the cooperative program. If you guys don't know this, let me just tell you. 
It helps with disaster relief, food banks, missionaries. It goes to a wide variety of things. It gets dispersed to these different organizations that we approve of. The flooding that happened in northern Iowa, there were Southern Baptist churches there feeding and, and having setting up these mobile units to feed thousands of people whenever there's a, a hurricane or disaster. We have teams that will spend millions of dollars to go into an area and give meals out, three meals a day, and shower units and all that, and a place to do laundry. Isn't it nice that we don't have to always be looking for a legitimate organization? It's good to know that what we call the cooperative program, I'm, I'm doing a little education here. Like, do we ever help out with disaster relief? Yeah, every Sunday, a portion of that is saved up to go to those different organizations. Disaster relief, tornadoes when they hit, hurricanes when they hit, the flood that hit northern Iowa. Things like that, those are special. We might have a Lottie Moon, Annie Armstrong, and then a portion is set aside. In Philippians chapter 4, if you turn to Philippians chapter 4, when Paul is writing... Philippians 4, you yourselves know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter, matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I've received everything in full and have an abundance, and I'm amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like worship to me. It was a gift that was... A plea, this is Old Testament language. You know, where they bring in the burn the incense and they got the altar. That's what's going on here. We don't have an altar. We don't have incense. Not that if you have potpourri and those essential oils. Okay? He's saying that's what these are. These gifts. It's definitely a worship thing. It's definitely, to me, my Christian life is all of it together. And what's interesting about this first day of the week, by the way, who's supposed to support these people? I mean, even if you think about our building, here's a turnoff to non-Christians. I should have had this as a question. Your non-Christian co-worker says, why do you go to church and why do you give? Do you have an answer for them? I think one would be just, it's an act of my worship. Pragmatically speaking, we talked about that in our Sunday school class. Who's supposed to pay for the lights and the insurance and the upkeep? How many are glad you have a full-time pastor who can do funerals and weddings and visits and stuff like that and prepare sermons every Sunday? In the Old Testament, the priesthood, part of their giving, supported that priesthood. We don't have that anymore. But in the New Testament, you do have these special collections and you do have the support of ministry because who, who's, it's not the government's job. How many believe in separation of church and state? Me. Right? How many are glad for the freedom of religion in our country? Me. We take care of Christian missions. We don't ask the government to be involved in that. We don't want them involved in our stuff, we, right? Vice versa. So, Philippians chapter 4 is a, another great uh, text for that. Now, I, wanna, I could camp out here, and I may do another sermon on this. This first day of the week, the gathering of God's people, question number five would be this. How many things can you list concerning what takes place as Christians meet together on Sunday? Why do you go to church would be your coworkers. Why do you go to church? Could you name some things? By the way, when somebody asks you about giving, oh, yeah, 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 I don't go to church because all they talk about is giving. At least you could say, you know what, I've been going there 25 years. I can't even think of a sermon. And well, now you can. Yeah, I tell you, you old leaver, yeah, I, guess what he talked about tonight? He talked about giving. Yeah, does he do that a lot? No, that's the only time I've ever heard him talk about it. I hate talking about it. 
but I shouldn't now because it's right there in the text. But the world has a different answer. By the way, if you're married to a non-Christian, I know it's a tension thing. There's a guy sitting in here. His wife got saved first. Dad, I can't believe, and I won't name her name. They're here today. Can you believe she gives $5 a week? And his dad said, you better put your foot down because that's crazy. Hey, is that true? <laughs> true story. Some of you may know who I'm talking about. If you're married to a non-Christian, they don't get it. And so to non-Christians, I say this. I know you're in a humanitarian stuff, like, or not humanitarian, what you, humane society. I know you give to dogs and cats, and that shelter needs, I mean, how are they supposed to stay? How many of you know people, like at their funeral, they'll have give to the humane society? Why? Now, why do they do that? Is it somebody that hates dogs and cats? No, usually it's the opposite. And nothing against that. Nothing against that. If you, if you give to that, that's fine. What, what I'm saying is, why does somebody do that? They love cats and dogs, and they, they, they want to give to what they believe in. That's how I reason with people. Look, you do this and this and this. Why do you do it? Because that's where your heart's at. I don't expect non-Christians to get what Christians do, but I want to be able to explain it to them. You should be able to explain. Why do you go to church? Well, that's just what you're supposed to do. I think I've got some better reasons. Just in 1 Corinthians, if you named what we've been looking at in 1 Corinthians, what happens when you go to church? Chapter 11. Chapter 11. By the way, I got a letter from somebody. Pastor, I listen to you sometimes, but I'm upset that you say that Christians ought to meet with other Christians. Uh, yeah, that's what the New Testament assumes. That's what it teaches. That if you're Christian, you're able... If you're not able, we understand, and we, know, we understand that there are backslidden Christians who are just being disobedient in that area right now. Ha, raise your hand if you know some people who say they're Christians, but they don't gather with God's people. I always like to say this. New Testament assumes that if you're able, that you meet with God's people. What are, why? Well, you take communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. When you gather together, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? To sell? Did Jesus say celebrate his death and resurrection by taking communion did he say that did he command a way for christians to remember him is that what he said and you're saying no the lord's supper is for the assembly of god's people to celebrate their lord who died and rose again on their behalf if that's the only thing we did we're doing it next weekend Get this, they're Christians who say, I don't need to meet with God's people and have been disobedient now year after year after year after year after year after year of doing what Jesus commanded that we do. Ouch. 1 Corinthians, or Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Singing together with one another. I sing in my car, I sing in my shower. Don't I, Pam? I was singing this morning. <laughs> I have a certain song list that's called shower songs. I just sing. <laughs> You're like, I didn't need to know that. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, oh, I can worship in a John boat. I can worship. I know you can. How many worship outdoors somewhere? But that's not the worship with the believers. Colossians, we are teaching one another with our songs. That's another reason we gather. What's another reason? Well, the collection of the saints. That's another reason. What's another reason? To hear God's word, to worship through reading his word. That's what pastors are called to do. And I could list you a whole list of verses. So the person who says, I don't need to assemble. Ah. You're not under any kind of spiritual leadership. Acts chapter 14, verse 23. They appointed the elders. Elders are to teach the word of God. Paul told Timothy that. Chapter 14. 3, chapter 5, verse 17, Titus chapter 1. So I go to hear God's word because I'm a Christian. I want to be directed by his word. I want to take communion because Jesus died for my sorry soul and rose again. I'm, I'm getting a glorified, incorruptible, powerful body. 
and a new heaven and a new earth. I think I could go and meet with God's people. Now, we know things come up. We know that there's reunions and vacations. I'm talking about habitual. I'm talking about those who week after week after week after week. Why? I found something wrong. Have you, have you met these people? They can never find a perfect church to be a part of. <laughs> I wonder why. Was Corinthians the perfect church? By no means. But you know what? At least they were beating as God's people. And Paul's trying to reform them. Why? Because he loves them. And they're a group of Christians. And so let me just say, I really, I'm thinking about after I do Corinthians, do a series. Here are six reasons why, if you're a believer, you ought to be meeting with God's people. Well, pastor, I saw you yesterday buy a bag of shrimp at Walmart. Levada, I went through Levada's line. Where's Levada? And uh, uh, I bought shrimp. Well, the pastor bought shrimp. Doesn't he know that Leviticus 16 says you aren't supposed to eat shrimp and catfish? Yeah, those are called kosher laws for the Jewish people. Guess what? Paul says, don't, first, this is Colossians. Now, if you don't want to eat shrimp or catfish, that's okay, or pork. Under the new covenant, under the new covenant over here, I have the freedom to eat those things. But if you don't want to, that's fine. How many notice the difference? I'm a new covenant Christian. So as a new covenant Christian, we don't have altars. We don't have incense and priesthood and all that. We have pastor elders who teach. And when we meet, we're doing all of these things. And, and one of the things, and I hope this really changes how you think about giving. It's an act of worship. Here's the thing I've heard when somebody's looking at our church. If I can be on my soapbox just for a second. I'm not going to give because you guys have money in the bank. Yeah, you know what? We haven't been able to add on. Have you seen some Sundays that's packed in here and the parking lot's packed? And when we looked at the cost of building a building, as God's people, we said, we can't go into that much debt because that could sink us. So let's save up. And so when we need to add on, here's the debate. Is it going that way, that way, or that way? I don't know. Let's just worry about it when we have enough. And we can't even hire a new staff person. You're like, well, shouldn't we have a... A youth minister that can do this and this or whatever. We don't have the finances to do that and to build. And so really every Christian, an act of worship should be, how am I participating? So on, one of the questions on here is, what's your own commitment to kingdom causes and support of the ministries of BBC if you do believe BBC is a worthy cause? Do you believe it is? And so just asking ourselves, what is our commitment to God? What are the ministry needs met through BBC's cooperative program? Knowing, do you know how many missionaries you help send out? Overseas missionaries. Three, over 3,500. You. So when Paul says in Philippians 1, 6, your partic- I thank God for your participation in the gospel. You're like, they didn't go anywhere. You know, they didn't but they were participating in the gospel by sending out missionaries. Now, how many of you believe that you should be sharing the faith around here? Isn't it good to know that you, like the Philippians, can also say, this is my act of worship. I'm sending out missionaries who are going far to reach places, to live in hard circumstances, and I'm helping them be there. So my my prayer would be, uh, number nine, read through the following verses this week and just contemplate, this life is so short. It is, isn't it? How How am I living it in this area? As an act of worship. And to see what Jesus says. Man, Jesus said a lot about this topic. And I was reading this week in Matthew. It's like, you can't serve two masters, but you can. Matthew chapter 16, or 6, and, and, and following. And Luke, hey, this farmer, he's going to build more barns and buy a new John Deere, do this and this, and I'm going to... And then his soul's required of him. That's Luke chapter 12. That one's shocking. Nothing wrong with building bigger barns. 
that he had no place for God in his life. The text says, today your soul is required of you. There's going to be a little old lady standing in heaven. I do believe that God does reward faithfulness, and there's going to be a little old lady nobody ever thought of. (laughs) She's going to be rewarded. Salvation is a free gift, but how many believe the Bible also teaches this idea of rewards? And only God knows. See, here's a weird thing. God knows my heart and your heart. Only God knows. Is my life one of worship? Do I come here because I want to worship the Lord? Am I a part of his kingdom work because I love him? God knows that. And my prayer is that we would be able to look, as, 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 look at this as a congregation and say, yeah, Pastor Kendall does talk about that. Why? Because it's, it's in the word. Look, if you're not a Christian, we don't want you to give. You said that, Kendall? Yeah. I said, if you're, if you're not a Christian, Christianity is a free gift of God. I get forgiveness of sins. I get eternal life. So please, if you're a Christian, don't give. I hope the deacons don't talk to me after service about me saying that. Why? Because what we see in the New Testament are Christians. Why? Because our heart's been changed. It's an act of worship. My friend, Leonard, witnessing to everybody, the guy that told me if I didn't shut up, he could get me knocked off for $500, that guy with a neck this big. The bad thing Leonard used to do is he would go around and witness to people, and I'd tell him, he would pick out a guy who was involved in the occult and go witness to him, and I said, Leonard, I don't want, so I tell I told him, don't witness to people, Leonard, because you're not even a Christian yet. Why don't you bow your head with me in prayer? Are you a Christian? Have you received the forgiveness of sins, the gift of eternal life? You stop being a rebel in God's world and say, God, I'm a sinner in need of forgiving, need of forgiveness. I want to turn my life over to you. Lord Jesus, would you forgive me, cleanse me, make me new? And with the rest of my life, I want to serve you until you call me home. Or would you use our local church here, thankful for the bike ministry and other ministries that you raise up, and I'm thankful that I get to preach the word here unhindered. But Lord, with this short time that we have here, we want to live for you. Would you use us? Would you open up new opportunities? for us to serve. And I thank you for the blessing that this letter has been in my life personally. So you call us home. May we be found faithful. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Still offers there every Sunday. If you've become a Christian, maybe you're, you've been a Christian for some time, but you have not been baptized yet. We're going to be doing some bapti- uh, baptizing soon. So please get with me so we can set up some dates. Let's stand. What song are we going to sing, guys?